We open our Bibles this morning in the book of Genesis and the, Ge the, the uh, book of Genesis chapter number 37. And we just end in just a few verses here in Genesis chapter 37. Uh, could I also say that it will be from next Lord's Day, we will have the list of communicant members so as person to be able to check just those names that are on the list uh, are to our clerk of session so as people do know that they're listed, so we'll have it uh, available to people uh, to see that from next Lord's Day. Uh, so as therefore, if your name is there on that list, then certainly that is the official list of, uh, but as I've said, uh, members or people do not join at this juncture uh, for that voting uh, that will take place very, uh, very quickly. Let's just read the, the scriptures in Genesis chapter 37. It says in verse 34, And Joseph rent his clothes, and put sackcloth upon his loins, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, and captain of the guard. Now turn to chapter 39. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him off the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And the master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and made him overseer over his house. And all that he had, he put into his hand. And it came to pass from that time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught that he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. We end our reading there, and we know that God will, as he always do, does, he'll bless his word to our hearts for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's just have a wee word of prayer, please. Let's commit our service to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come around thy precious and thy holy word, and I pray now in the Savior's precious name that thou will bless thy word to our hearts. We pray that once again that we might be instructed and that we might be guided in our daily living, even as we look at this godly example of what a Christian should be. And I pray that Thou will help us as believers to have a goodly testimony. O oh God, our Father, I pray that we might have a testimony amongst those that we live with. We think of the stories we're looking in the Bible class this morning of a man who lost that, a man who had no testimony in his family. His name was Lot. And, O oh God, I pray that in Jesus' precious name that we might have a testament in our home as well as the community in which we live. And so bless us now and do us good, for we pray in Jesus' precious name and for his sake and glory. Amen. Now, last Lord's Day in our study of this passage of God's Word, we have been looking at the life of Joseph, and we noticed last Lord's Day his stripping because they took the coat of many colors of Joseph and they threw him into the pit. And then we secondly noticed his selling, because they sold him as a slave. His brothers sold him as a slave as he sat down, and they saw these Ishmaelite uh, people coming along, and they decided instead of killing him that they would be content in that they would sell him, and they would gain from it. Then, of course, we found that uh, his sprinkled coat was the third thing we noticed, 
because they took his coat and they brought it to his father. And of course, as we said, his father got the wrong conclusion because even though he looked at a coat that was completely intact, yet the grief in his heart just closed that out of his mind. And all he could see was the blood on the coat and naturally thought that Joseph was dead, he was torn asunder. But as I noticed that, have you looked at the case closer? He would have known that the animal couldn't have rent Joseph to pieces without rending the coat. And yet the coat was completely intact together. But it was sprinkled in blood. And what I want us then to see, as we look at verse number 36 of this chapter, uh, verse uh, 36 of chapter 37, And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, and captain of the guard. You know, it seems to be at this moment all things are lost. And yet here we see his sovereign. Because Joseph is on his way down to Egypt now, and all his brethren had turned against him, he has been taken from his father, he has been taken from the love and the care and the protection of his father's home, and also his brother Benjamin, and he's facing a very uncertain future. You know, I was thinking about this. You know, Joseph never desired to take Reuben's place. He never asked his father for Reuben's place, but it was something that his father gave him because it was rightly his, because he was a goodly and a godly person. And so, therefore, we find that he's on his way now to slavery. And yet, there's a wonderful thought. You know, it's better to be a slave in Egypt experiencing the presence of the Lord than to be with his brothers as they hold up that stained, blood-stained coat to their father, and they carry on lying and with a sin-ridden conscience for the next 22 years. But friend, let's be honest. As I see Joseph traveling down there, and he's on his way to Egypt, I'm sure that maybe there was a thought come into his mind. Why is God allowing this to happen? Why? You know, that's a little word that, that troubles an awful lot of people. Whenever their backs against the wall, or tragedy hits them, or trouble comes into their lives, the natural question is, why? Why? Why has God allowed this to happen? What is happening to me? What is God doing? Where is God in the midst of this situation? And friend, those are questions that sometimes that rend many a heart. And that's the usual cry today. Whenever some tragedy happens, and the world looks at the believer and says, well, where is your God now? Where's your God now? Some people have got this idea that God's children should never experience the normal afflictions of the body, or that God's children should never go through uh, sickness or, or go through trouble in their lives. There are other people, whenever these things happen, they just simply turn on God, and they blame God and say, God, you know, this is not fair. Why are you doing this to me? The Holy Ghost is completely silent about any of that in Joseph's life. It just simply says, the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Potiphar's, and captain of the guard. And then go to chapter 39, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him off the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither, and the Lord was with Joseph. And so we find that in actual fact, it's interesting, notice in chapter 37, actual, actually, God's name is not mentioned there anywhere. God's not mentioned in chapter 37. And yet God was completely in control. Had God abandoned Joseph to his, uh, the, the, the evil scheme of, of the brothers? The answer is no. Everything seems to be spinning out of control. Is that the way it is in Joseph's life? Is that the way that it happens in our lives? Let me tell you, friends, as you study this story, every point, Joseph is exactly where God wanted him to be. And that's important for you to remember in your situation today, that every point of Joseph's life, he was where God wanted him to be. And you know, just like Joseph, we too can be in the center of God's will. And friend, that sometimes can be in the center of a storm. Do you remember the Lord Jesus Christ? He asked his disciples, he commanded them to go to the other side, 
after preaching a great sermon, and he, 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 he told them to launch out and to go to the other side. And as the Lord Jesus Christ was there on that boat, the Lord laid down his, his head upon a pillow, and the Savior fell asleep. Then all of a sudden, there was a great storm. And these men were so fearful, they were caught up with a storm, and they couldn't take it anymore. These big hard men, and they run to where Jesus is lying asleep and say, Master, do you not care? Do you not care if we perish? Have you ever charged God foolishly about that, friend? Because there's a storm in your life, God, do you not care? Do you not care? Friend, let me tell you, God's child cannot perish. Thank God, whenever we're saved, we will never perish. No matter what else happens to us, thank God, no matter how great the storm is, God's child will not be lost in the storm. God's child will not be consumed or perish in the midst of the storm. I love those words in Proverbs chapter 3, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. And as you study the life here of Joseph with me, friend, listen, God can put us exactly where he wants us to be. And that's where Joseph was. Even down there in Egypt, God puts him exactly where he wants us to be, and God can arrange all the details. Even years in advance, God can arrange the details. We've been looking in the book of Ezra how that God, years in advance, named the very person that would be the person who would order and tell the children of Israel to leave Babylon and go back to their homeland and raise the house unto the Lord. God had him named before he ever was born. God arranges things, all the details, years in advance. And let me tell you, God can open doors even when the doors are tightly shut. Humanly speaking, let me tell you, this was disaster for Joseph. But God would open doors here. God would do a miracle here. And God can remove every obstacle that's in the way. And God can take tragedy. God can turn it to his glory. Why? Because God's in control. Had God stopped controlling Joseph's situation? No, he wasn't. God was in absolutely in control of the situation. In Psalm 115, it tells us there in the verse number 3, it says these words, But our God is in heaven. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. There's a sovereign. God is sovereign. I remember when I was out in Puerto Rico, I heard me say this before, there's a young pastor. And this young pastor, his wife, was very seriously ill. And they had, I think it was two wee children. And she was very seriously ill. And she was coming near the end of life's journey. And he was sitting beside his bed, and he was looking at his two wee children, and his heart was breaking. And he was wondering why. And his wife reached out her hand, and she said to him, to her husband, just remember Psalm 115, verse 3. Our God is in heaven. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And friend, that's important. You know, we struggle, we battle at times against what God is doing, and yet, thank God, the Lord is in control of all the situations. And that's exactly what is happening in the life of Joseph. You know, sometimes God allows the enemies to put us to the test, to see what character we are, to see who we really are. You know, the sad reality is this, that Joseph's enemies were his brothers. Those that should be closest to him. His own flesh and blood. What does the Word of God say in, in, in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 35? A man's foes shall be they of his household. So you and I shouldn't be surprised whenever sometimes, 
even in our own household, when people rise up against us. You know, you leave them in God's hands. You don't try to do hurtful things to them. You just leave them with God. I've seen people, you know, and maybe their brothers hurt them or their sisters hurt them, and they plan and scheme how they'll hurt them back. Let me tell you, leave it with God, friend. Don't desire their hurt. Desire their healing. But leave them with God. You will notice that we came from, we've moved from chapter 37 and we've moved to chapter 39. What about chapter 38? What about it? Why did we not deal with chapter 38? Because, friend, let me tell you this. Chapter 38 is not about Joseph. It's about his brother who sold him. About the brother that decided that he would sell him to the Ishmaelites. The brother that decided that they would throw him into a pit. And then they would sell him for profit. It was his own brother. But you know what we find in chapter 30? It, Judah would pay the price of his own folly. Interesting thing is this. He paid the price in his own family. We're not going into the story, friend, but let me just show you two you think. Go to chapter 38 for a moment. All would be very careful what you do, friend. You leave things in God's hands. Really, if you're going to trust Him, then you trust Him for everything. In chapter 38, it says this. It tells us in verse 30, uh, 38, verse 6, And Judah took a wife for heir his firstborn. In other words, he now has a son. And he took a wife for heir his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And ere Judas firstborn was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And this is what it says in verse 7. And the Lord slew him. Don't play around whenever God's in the midst of the story, friend. And the Lord slew him. Joseph didn't touch him. Doesn't say even that Joseph wished him ill. But he handed the situation to God. And that's what you need to do in your life. You need to hand your situation to God, friend. Listen, that's the one thing. And the Lord slew him. Look in verse number 10. And this is now Onan. That's the second son. It says, And the thing which Onan did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. I remember Judah, and they planned that they would kill the goat. And they would tell their father they brought the goat with the blood, the coat with, the, with, with the, the blood of the goat in it, and they would hand it to the father, and they would pretend to their father that somehow they found it, and that he, Joseph, was dead. He was slain. I'm going to tell you, Judah's finding now his sons are dead. Ere his firstborn, dead. Onan, his secondborn, dead. And I can tell you, there was no false story this time. It was real. Joseph was still alive, but heir and Onan's dead. He paid the price of his hurting godly Joseph. And the reason why we don't go to chapter 30 is this. We're studying Joseph, friend. Chapter 38's not about him. The story of Joseph continues in chapter 39. And so whilst Judah is grieving and will face the judgment of God upon his own family, here, where's Joseph? Joseph's down in the place where God allowed him to be. You see, when the worst the enemies can do, friend, they could not stop Joseph from doing and being God's choice. He was God's choice. He wasn't only his father's choice. He was God's choice. And nothing his brothers could do 
could cancel God's choice. Nothing. God knew about the betrayal. God knew about the slavery. God knew about Potiphar's wife. God knew about the false accusations. God knew about the present time. God knew about all of Joseph's life. But God's choice was Joseph. And isn't it comforting to know, friend, no matter what faces us, we're God's children. We're God's children. I'm a child of the King. No matter what I face this week, I'm a child of the king. And that was true. And as we see Joseph there, and he's down in the midst of the story, when we move to chapter 39, he's now down in Egypt. It says, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt, verse 1. And so he's down in Egypt. He's no longer viewed as the favorite son. He's just a fellow slave. That's all he is. He arrives in Egypt in chains. All his dreams have faded. It seems, humanly speaking, his life's in ruins. He's in a strange land. There are three things I want us to notice this morning if we have time. First of all, notice the servant or the slave. Because it says here, Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him off the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And once again I see the providence of God. It was Potiphar's house. Now, Potiphar means devoted to the sun. He was a heathen. He wasn't a believer in the living God. He knew nothing about Jehovah. And here we see the beloved son away from his father in the midst of slavery. Now, part of his job was to protect Pharaoh. He was the captain of the guard. And therefore, once again, here I see the problems of God because God allowed Joseph to be put into Potiphar's house where he would see all the workings of Egypt. You know what God was doing? God was preparing him for the day when he would become the leader in Egypt. This was God's plan. This was not life spinning out of control. This was God fulfilling his plan. He was gaining knowledge from Potiphar, the one that was there guarding the very king. And God put him into that place. This wasn't an accident. And friend, let me tell you, there are no accidents with God. You heard me say before, there are appointments, but there are no accidents with God. There are no accidents concerning God's child. And if what you're going through this day, let me tell you, it is not an accident with God. God knows what you're going through. God is sovereign in the midst of the situation that you're going through. And today's circumstance, let me tell you, it was a part of the schooling of the student Joseph for his days ahead. And let me tell you, he came out a brighter student. And that's what's happening to our lives. Whatever God permitting us to go through, what God is teaching us, He's developing our character. He's teaching us lessons to make us the godly person that God wants us to be, that we might live to glorify, because man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And what God is doing here, God is just developing the character of His godly child. In the book of Proverbs, in the chapter 15, verse 33, it says this, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. And God was going to raise Joseph to honor. But the plan of God is this, before honor, humility. And we've got to learn that lesson. You know, sometimes for to lift us up, God has to bring us down. Sometimes for to make us the person that God wants us to be, friend, God has got to knock the edges off us. 
Because we can get arrogant whenever we have blessing, and whenever God blesses us, somehow we think that's all because of us, and not of God. And so we find here the slave. But secondly, notice the secret. Verse number two. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. He was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now, here's a young lad coming down to Egypt, friend. His brothers had betrayed him. They took that coat off his back. He doesn't know what's happened to his father. He doesn't know what's happening at home. He could sit down there in Egypt, friend, and he could feel bitter. He has lost his position. He has lost his possessions. He has lost his friends. He has lost his comfort. He has lost his father's, earthly father's presence. He could feel angry. But notice what he didn't lose. Look at verse 2. The Lord. The Lord was with Joseph. He didn't lose the Lord. He didn't lose the Lord's presence. And I believe that there we find the very secret of it. Do you remember what Moses said in the book of Exodus whenever he was crying out unto God? And he said this in Exodus chapter 33 and verse number 15. When God says, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto God, If thy presence go not with me, carry me not up hence. Because he realized it was more important to have the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord than anything else. You know, I was thinking about Joseph. Let me tell you, friend, this is what F.B. Meyer said. Though stripped of his coat, he had not been stripped of his character. They stripped him of his coat, but they didn't strip him of his character. Now, Joseph's down in Egypt, friend. And you know the old adage is this, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And Joseph could have said, well, listen, my brothers have sold me out. And where's God in the midst of the situation? Well, I'm just going to do what they do down here in Egypt. I'm going to be down in Egypt here, and I'm just going to be one of them. He didn't do that. Joseph lived right because his heart was right with God. That makes it, listen, if your heart's right with God, friend, if your heart's right with God, friend, even though they strip you of everything, you'll still have the Lord, and you'll not be disappointed. Everything else may leave you. Friends may leave you. Family may leave you. But if you've got the Lord, the presence of the Lord, Moses said, Lord, if your presence goes out with me, then don't take me hence. It's your presence that's more important. The Lord's more important. I remember when I was a child, my father used to a coat, and some of the old generation had strange coats to make. And he used to say this to us, judge not a man by the coat he wears, as a long life's journey he jogs, for many a handsome collar adorns a worthless dog. And I read this little coat this past week, and it says this, it isn't the style nor the stuff in the coat nor the length of the tailor's bill. It's the stuff in the chap inside the coat that counts for good or ill. That's a good statement. I thought it was a good one. Because you see, friend, listen, they took Joseph's coat away but he was still the same person. He was still godly Joseph. And though his friends had turned his back on him, praise God there was a secret in Joseph's life. 
And it says, and the Lord was with him. Joseph was there down in Egypt, but he was aware of the presence of the Lord. Joseph was in prison, but he was aware of the presence of the Lord. You study this story of Joseph, and that's the secret, friend. The presence of the Lord. He was conscious of God. Always living conscious of God. Look at chapter 39, verse 9. Whenever he was tempted to sin. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this wicked, great wickedness and sin against God? He was conscious of God there. Look at chapter 40. Look at verse number 8. And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto him, Do not interpretations belong to God. Joseph doesn't turn his back on God because situations are hard. No, he knows that God is in the midst of the situation. Look at chapter 41. Verse 16, it says this, And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not me. God shall give Pharaoh the answer of peace. In verse 25 of the same chapter, And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he's about to do. Look at chapter 45. And in chapter 45, in the verse number 5, it says this, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me. God did send me before you to preserve my life. Look at verse 7 of the same chapter. And God sent me. Look at verse 8. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. He saw God in a situation. God was in the midst. He was conscious of the presence of God. Chapter 48, verse 9. And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. Look at chapter 50, verse 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. For am I in the place of God? As for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good. You see, friends, let me tell you, even in his darkest moment, God was in his mind. He hadn't forgotten the Lord. And God was not only in his mind, but God was in his heart. And God was not only in his heart, thank God, God was constantly on his lips. Why? Because it tells us way back there in chapter 39, verse 2, and the Lord was with Joseph. Now notice this. Verse 3. Not only did Joseph know the Lord was with him, but it says this, and his master saw that the Lord was with him. His master saw it. What a witness, friend. Joseph was a witness in his master's house. You see, Joseph didn't sit down when he became a slave. He didn't turn around and say, well, listen, I'm so angry. I'll be the worst slave that there is. They're not going to, I never was a slave, and I'm not going to become a slave. And no matter what they do, they'll not make me a slave. He didn't go to Egypt like that. He was conscious in the midst of all God was with him. God sent me. God sent me. Yes, God, that revealed that to him later on. But there was a consciousness in Joseph's heart that the Lord was with him in the whole situation. And that was seen by his master. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. He recognized there was something different about it. Joseph wasn't like any other slave, friend. 
He lived his testimony. And that's important for you and me, friend. That is important for you and me, that we live our testimony. Potiphar recognized that Joseph was loyal. He was somebody to be trusted. He worked well with others. He showed leadership amongst others. There was something different about this lad. And it says this, and his master saw that the Lord, now remember, he was a heathen. He didn't know Jehovah. Well, then how did he know that the Lord was with him? Because Joseph spoke of his master, his master, the Lord. There's something different about this lad. And friend, let me tell you, that's what God's children ought to be. That's the kind of a person you ought to be in your work. And as those around you look upon you, they know there's something different because you're honest. You do an honest day's work. And I tell you, it grieves me whenever people say to me, they're supposed to be a Christian. And I remember when I was in the council, I remember a person saying to me, you know, there's a person in this council and he's supposed to be a Christian. And let me tell you, he's a loafer. He's a, lazy, a layabout. And he doesn't do an honest day's work. And he takes every opportunity to, 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 to get off his work. And that's the testimony he had amongst the ungodly in the place. And he'll stretch the break, his dinner break, or his 11 o'clock break, he'll stretch it as long as he can to keep away from work. And if there's anything to gripe about, you can be sure he's the one that's leading it. And if there's any complaint, you can be sure he's in the front row. And then he turned around to me, tell me, I should be a Christian. Then tell me, what do you think the world sees that? When the world sees that, what, what do you think the world thinks about that? And I say this honestly before God, let me tell you. You and I in our workplace, we ought to witness our, by our lives the glory of the Lord. And it was seen. Here was a person who had got a, an amenable... An he was a man of boundless integrity. The master saw the Lord. Look at verse 4 very quickly and times away. And Joseph found grace in his master's sight, and he served him. And then he made him overseer over his house. And all that he had, he put into his hand. And it came to pass from that time that he made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. He became a blessing. Even in an ungodly man's house, it says he be, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in his house and in his field. There's a success. Because the secret was this. The Lord with him. In verse 6 and we finish, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. Do you know why? Because he could be trusted. He knew that here was a slave, that he was different from all the rest. He knew here was a lad that could be trusted. He had got an integrity. There was something different. What is it, Joseph? Joseph says, you see, the Lord's with me. I'm honoring the Lord here, even in slavery. I'm honoring Christ. And friend, no matter what your situation of mine is, whether it be easy, whether it be difficult or not, you and I need to live for the Lord. that the world will see Jesus in us.
and he became a blessing, even in his master's house. Are you a blessing in your workplace? Are you? Is that your earnest desire? When you get up in the morning and you go out to work, please, God, make me a blessing today that through me others will be brought to know Jesus too. May God grant it for Jesus' sake. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for every one of your children today. I pray that, oh God, no matter where we go, no matter what we do, in the workplace, on the farm, Lord, in the carpenter's bench, in the, Lord, wherever it be, whatever the office or the place where you put us, oh God, I pray that people will see that the Lord's with us, that they'll see our testimony. Lord, the psalmist said, he put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God, many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Please, God, make us that witness for thee. In Jesus' name.